This morning I'm continuing uh, my series on ultimate devotion. Today we're talking about outward change. Kind of up until this point, we've been talking about the value of the Bible, the value of prayer, how all these things can change the inside of us. But now today we're going to look at what does it mean when that manifests on the outside? What is the outward change? What are we kind of looking for here? How do we show that we have an ultimate devotion to God? As you know, tomorrow is Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Day. It's, it's the day we set aside on our national calendar to honor the man. In thinking of injustice and the things that he fought against, I started thinking back to the times that I knew injustice in my life. And I'll admit, I had a very charmed childhood. Um, I didn't know a whole lot of injustice in my life. But the one time I can think of, and it's something that, that some of you may be able to identify with, and most of you can probably imagine was this. My friends and I, we would go to church, and my, my dad was our lead pastor. He was a senior pastor at our church. We would go to church, and we'd go to a children's church, and we'd have a good time. After children's church, we would do what little boys are supposed to do. We would go around, and we would wreak havoc anywhere we could. We would take all the paper towels out of the paper towel dispenser. We would unroll all the toilet paper rolls. We would, you know, take the chalkboard and, and write not nice words on the chalkboards in the Sunday school classrooms. Not cuss words, don't worry. Just not nice words. We might write like stupid or idiot, you know, Christian cuss words. We'd post the things we weren't supposed to post. We'd go hide in Sunday school classrooms. We'd figure out, you know, oh, we're having, um, we're going to have a special dinner on Wednesday night. Well, that means they already bought the good grape juice. So we'd go have a little bit of good grape juice. We do whatever, ever, whatever we were supposed to do. We were just supposed to have fun. That's what it's like to be a little boy. But it was inevitable. We would always get caught. Every time we would get caught. And what would happen is we would get caught and every other little boy that I was with would not get in any trouble. They wouldn't even tell their parents on them. But guess what they would do with me? They would grab me by the arm, they would march you up to my dad, they would stand me in front of my dad and they would say, you're the senior pastor of this church, look at what your little hellion is doing. I couldn't believe it. If that's not injustice, I don't know what it is. They all got to dodge the bullet. I got to take the bullet. I got to take like 20 bullets. That's what it felt like. How dare they pick the pastor's kid to be the one who gets in trouble? If you're going to let them go, let me go. That seems fair, doesn't it? I told my dad that one time. In fact, I was a little bit older. I was 13, 14 years old. We were in youth group at the time. I'd done something I wasn't supposed to do, and, and it was his favorite saying, but I... I went to him. He said, you know, you're in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. I said, well, Dad, it's not fair. I said, it's not fair that they didn't get in trouble and I'm getting in all this trouble. You know what he did? He looked me in the eye and he said, life's not fair. And I thought, ooh, that's mean of you to say. How dare you tell me that life's not fair? I live in America. Life is always fair in America. It's the way things are supposed to be in America. We're, we're the land of freedom and the home of the brave, and we sing the Star Spangled Banner before we play baseball. Of course life is fair. Life's not fair. I used to think that was the meanest thing he could ever tell me until one day I was talking to Tyler, my oldest, and he told me that's not fair, and I heard those words come out of my mouth. Life's not fair. It was a shocker. It was a shocker. It wasn't until I became a little bit older, of, of course we tried to learn about injustice when we were younger, but it wasn't until I was a little bit older that I really started studying the life of Martin Luther King Jr. And many of us know his I Have, the Dream, I Have a Dream speech, and we know his famous speeches. But there's a, a, a portion of, of a letter that I want to talk to you about this morning, just really quickly. It was when my eyes were kind of opened to the fact that our world has real injustice. It's not just this manufactured injustice that I feel like you're not being fair to me, so I'm going to take it out on you. No, our world has real injustice. In the letter from the Birmingham jail in 1963, Martin Luther King is outlining many of the problems that, that America has at the time. The 1960s were a time of great turmoil within our nation. Brothers were rising against brothers. There were, there were disagreements within churches about how to handle the civil rights uh, movement. And it came to the point where, where Martin Luther King writes this letter and, and he directs it, many of his sayings, he directs directly to Christians. 
And he speaks about the idea that self-purification is one of the keys to overcoming injustice in our world. I, I, I took that term, self-purification, I said, what on earth is he talking about? What on earth does he mean? I went and I started exploring the life of Martin Luther King Jr. This is why I was in college. I was exploring his life and, and finding out you know, what kind of pushed him forward. And I realized that when he speaks of self-purification, he's speaking of two things. He's talking of prayer and of fasting. It's of allowing God to take the injustice out of your own heart so that he can take it out of the world around us. See, we grew up telling our children, life's not fair. And I agree, life's not fair. But we as Christians, we must understand that there is an inward purification, a self-purification. Not self in that we're doing it to ourselves, but self-purification in that we're allowing ourselves to be changed so that God can change us, so that we may change the world. See, fasting played an important role in the life of Martin Luther King Jr. He fasted many times. Many times when he was faced with a, a terrible problem or an, an unsolvable conundrum, he would go to the Lord and he would pray and he would fast. So this morning, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 58, and we're going to look at the Israelites as they fasted to get God's attention. We're going to understand what does fasting really mean? Or is, it, is it really an outward change? Is that really what we're looking for? Now, I recognize this morning fasting is probably not a topic that many in the room want to talk about. Um, it's not much fun to talk about depriving yourself of something that you want. But the truth of the matter is that it's one of our core Christian principles. It's one of our foundations that draws us closer to God. So in order to talk about ultimate devotion, about the things that devote us to God, if I didn't talk about fasting, I would be remiss. So this morning, what I want to talk to you about is three points out of Isaiah chapter 58. The first one is forcing God to see me. The Israelites are, are trying to force God. God, look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at how awesome I am. Isaiah 58 says this. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does not know what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and they seem eager for God to come near them. We have fasted. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? The Israelites at this time, they're, they're crying out to God and they're saying, God, we've fasted, we've prayed, we've, we've done what we're supposed to do. We, we've checked the check mark off. Yet, it seems as though you're not listening to us. To be able to understand Isaiah 58, we have to take a little bit more of the story and we have to understand that what's going on in the, in the Israelite saga at this point. Isaiah has been called and he's speaking to the king of, of Judah and as he speaks to the king, there's a, there's a conquering that has already taken place of the northern kingdom of Israel. They're already in captivity to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom is just about to be conquered. And now the people are turning back to God and they're saying, God, why aren't you saving us? Our cousins in the north, they've already been captured. They've already been taken into the Assyrians. We're fasting. We're, we're doing the things that our religion tells us to do. And yet you're silent. Why are you silent, God? See, the, the Israelites found themselves disobeying God and wondering, why is he not paying attention to me? Why is he not interacting with me? See, hindsight's 20-20, and looking on it now, we can understand, well, they were disobeying God. They weren't doing the things that God had told them to do, and even they, if they were doing them, they weren't doing them with the right heart. They were just doing them out of religious obligation. They were trying to force God to see me. God, look at me. God, look what I've done. It's all focused on me, 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 me. And I know that's not within our church, but in our culture of America, me, 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 me seems to be our rallying cry. Look at me. Look what I've done. Look how good I am. I would never do that. But see, we've tried to force God to see me instead of looking back toward God. Instead of forcing ourselves to see God. 
the desire of fulfillment of the prophecy that one day a Messiah is going to come, a Savior is going to come. They desire that, that God would send this person. They're fasting for it. They're praying for it, that God would deliver them from the hand of the Assyrians. Yet God seems to not take notice. God seems to be looking away. When I was in high school, I would go into to the lunchroom at, at Mustang High School. It was, a, it was a fairly large high school. I had a lot of friends that, that we would hang out together at lunches. In that high school, it was a very small town, but in, in the town, there were um, two extremely large youth groups, and then there were a couple medium-sized youth groups and then a couple small youth groups. It seemed as though when I would go to high school that, that when I would go and sit in the cafeteria, 90% of the people around me attended a youth group somewhere. We all knew the, the essence of Christianity. We knew what Jesus was all about. There were times where I would go in and I would sit down, especially after the new year would come. Their youth pastor would stand up in front of them and he would preach to them about the necessity of fasting, about the necessity of praying. And they would come in and, and my friends, and I'll admit I, I did this even a couple times, we would come into the lunch group and, and almost like a, a proud moment, we would sit down without a tray in front of us. And we expected someone's going to ask us, where's your food? And when they ask, then that's, that's your moment to beam. And you say, oh, I'm fasting today. <laughs> and it's almost like you're a superhero all of a sudden. Oh, you can fast? You know how to fast? You know how to skip meals? Yeah, it's real easy. Don't put the food in your mouth. That's how you skip a meal. We would, we would go and we would spend time in the, in the lunchroom and, and many of my friends and even myself, we would, we would think that we were superheroes because we were checking off that check mark of religious obligation. We were doing what we had been told to do. All the gold seemed to come off a few times though. But immediately after, we'd leave that lunchroom and we would talk about how great God is and how he's called us to fasting and we're striving to be close to him. And then we would walk into our biology class and the very person that was fasting at lunch would ask me, can I copy your homework so that I can pass the grade? See, this idea of religious obligation does not equate to biblical Christianity. You can't force God to see you. You can't force God to recognize you. You can't force God to say you have done what's required to be done. Our desire should not be to be one of God's pets that he pulls us out occasionally and he says, look how good my little pet is. Our desire should be to be a follower of God, to constantly follow him, to constantly look to him. When we go into times of worship, our, our times of worship, and whether it's fasting or it's prayer or it's other acts of worship, they should not be done in such a way that we're trying to put ourselves onto a pedestal. Instead, they should be done in such a way that we are humbly seeking God. See, if your devotion to God begins in the public times, then you've missed it. The truth of the matter is that our devotion to God must begin in the privacy of our prayer times. Ultimate devotion does not mean I can stand up in front of people and say, look how awesome I am, or tell God, why have you not looked at me? Ultimate devotion means that in my private prayer time, I'm beginning the relationship that's going to change the way I interact with my world. I beg you this morning, if Sunday or even Sunday and Wednesday are the only times that you feed your soul and study God's word and pray and talk to him, if that's your only connection to God, deepen your relationship. There's so much more to this walk with Christ than, than I can even tell you about. There's so much more to, to knowing God than just, just coming to church on a Sunday morning for an hour and, and coming to church on a Wednesday night for an hour and saying, I'm done for the week. There's so much more to it. As we begin to develop a relationship with God and we pray to Him and we talk to Him and we read our Bible and we fast for His voice so that He may change what's inside of us, we no longer force God to see us. We force ourselves to see God. Forcing God into anything is not a good option. But what about forcing those around us to do something for us? Point number two, forcing others to serve me. Isaiah 58, 3b through 5. 
Yet on the day of your fasting, this is still God speaking, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all of your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fasting I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves. Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord. You can almost hear God's contempt here as he speaks to the prophet Isaiah. He says, you've, you, you, you're fasting one day a week, and yeah, I've asked you to do that, but the actions that you're showing are not the actions of a true faith in God. You're oppressing those who are around you. You're forcing those around you to serve you instead of serving God. You're holding down those with one hand and raising your other hand to God and saying, look how holy I am. When if we take our hand off those below us and we put both hands in the air and we worship God, we say, God, change me. As I fast and I pray, God, change me. Don't let me leave here the exact same way that I came in. Nothing had changed in the hearts of the Israelites. They wanted to be delivered from the Assyrians. They wanted the Messiah to come and save them. But their outward actions were not reflecting their heart. They were still oppressing those who were below them. They knew the right actions to do. They knew you put on sackcloth. They know you lay in ashes. They know that, that it's a moment where we're supposed to say, Oh, I'm fasting. Look at me. But they're still oppressing their workers. They're still denying the hungry food. Verse 4, the second part says this, You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. That's a clear call from God. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on, God, on, heard on high, heard by God. See, God's very clear that our actions show what's inside of us. Our religious obligation is not enough. It's not enough to say, oh yes, I've done this, and tomorrow I'll go do something else. God has asked us to stop serving ourselves and to actually serve Him. So we put on a facade, a mask of godliness, but underneath that mask is the dirty, grimy sinner that once was there and still always will be there. We know how to look religious, but maybe we don't know how to be Christians. Martin Luther King said this, There's so much frustration in the world because we have relied on gods rather than God. We have worshipped the God of pleasure only to discover the thrills play out and sensations are short-lived. See, he's speaking of the fact that we have made ourselves God and removed God from his throne. We say, I am the God. Oh yeah, I'll do the religious obligation stuff. I'll, I'll look like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but really I'm just serving myself. When I fast and my, I pray, it's not about getting closer to God, it's about getting what I want when we begin to worship the gods of pleasure. It's not about hearing God's voice, it's about making our voice louder than God when we worship the gods of pleasure. It's not about doing what we know to be right. It's about doing what would get us ahead in life when we worship the gods of pleasure. I don't want this morning you to hear me and think that I'm somehow against success in this life, that I'm somehow against those who, who have gotten ahead in life. I, I rejoice with you. That's great. That's awesome. Many in our church are successful, and I, I praise them for that. That's awesome. And they've done it in the right way. But many outside of our church walls are doing whatever they can to worship the gods of pleasure and abandoning God on high. See, when we make ourselves God, we commit treason against God. I knew a, a man once who used to tell me that he got up every morning at 5 a.m. and he would pray and he would talk to God and read his Bible. This man was, was a man that I knew I'd I knew him a while ago. He was one of the meanest people I ever knew. 
He really was. He was just a mean, crotchety old man. I mean, I'm convinced that if he spit, it was like Tabasco sauce that came out. That's how mean he was. Just mean. He would probably bite a dog if the dog bit him. That's how mean he was. But this guy was convinced that because he got up at five in the morning and he prayed and talked to God, that he was somehow completely holy. He had this, this dichotomy developed that I can live however I want to the rest of the day as long as at 5 a.m. I'm up praying and fasting. He said, I want you to understand this. Our religious fervor, our, our fervor for God, our religious fervor must be and done in such a way that our inner thoughts match our actions. In other words, don't just produce the outward change without changing the heart. If you can go through the motions and pretend to be a Christian, you've done yourself no favors. You're just hiding the sin and the filth that Christ wants to take away from you, wants to heal from you. God is not pleased with our false devotion with this idea that we can fast and in the same breath oppress those who are below us. He's only pleased with an ultimate devotion, with a true devotion to him, which allows fasting and prayer to change our hearts. He doesn't seek our empty words. So what is he looking for? What is God looking for? It's a question that many of us have have asked. What is God looking for? If he's not looking for me to, to check the box that said, I fasted this year, I fasted for, for so many days, I, I prayed this many times, I read my Bible for this many hours. If he's not looking for that, then what is he looking for? He's looking for this, point number three, total reliance on God. Isaiah 58, 6 through 9 says this. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. It is not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked to clothe them and not turn away them from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness or the righteous one will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Verse nine, this is the key right here. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. See, when we go beyond a false devotion, a mask that we have used to hide our true selves, and we open ourselves up to God and we say, God, change me. Help me to understand the role that I play in, in this world. Help me to understand how you've, how you've changed what was once a dirty and vile creature and, and covered my sin with your blood so that I may one day know your righteousness. As we begin to understand God, we hear verse 9 clearly. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. That's my prayer all the time. That when I pray to God and I ask God, God, help me, he's going to respond with, here am I. See, when we look at our world and we see all the problems, we say, God, why aren't you fixing the problems? Perhaps it's that his church, the people who are supposed to be following him, have not listened to him the way that we're supposed to. Perhaps instead of having an ultimate devotion, which breaks the chains of injustice and lifts up the oppressed, instead we have pushed those down with one hand and raised one hand to God and said, look how holy I am. If we're to understand God, we are to understand that we're to rely on Him completely. We're not to rely on meaningless acts of worship. If I lift my hands in worship and I feel nothing and I'm not worshiping God, it's pointless. You might as well go home. If you can read the Word of God and not allow it to change your heart, close the book. You don't understand what it's about. If you can pray and in your prayer time, all it is is you begging God to do for me, do for me, do for me, and you never take the moment to stop and ask him, God, what will you say to me? You're not doing it right. What I'm asking you this morning to do is to fully rely on God. As a teenager, I I hung out with a bunch of friends and We boiled down our Christianity to a simple list of do's and don'ts. We boiled it down and we say, you do this, you don't do this. 
What was amazing to me is, is one of my best friends in high school was actually um, a Mormon. And he and I would sit together and we would talk about what our do's and don'ts were, and they lined up almost perfectly. And I used to rejoice at that. I was like, yeah, my best friend's a Mormon. We get along great. We're not out partying like everyone else. This is cool. Until one day I started thinking about it. I was like, wait a second. My Christianity is the exact same as this guy's Mormonism. These don't line up. Why are they lining up? And I realized that instead of fully relying on God, I had instead boiled down Christianity to a list of yeses and nos. See, it's not about what our yeses and nos are. It's about our relationship with God. See, devotion and fasting must produce a change within us. We must find a total reliance on God. Fasting is an excellent exercise, and it yields amazing results. It yields things that you don't think can happen when we rely on God. Musicians, if you'll come. This morning, I'm, I'm not going to make a plea for you to fast for a certain amount of time this year. But what I'm going to say is if you haven't added it into your calendar, consider it. Consider fasting so that God may speak to you about the areas of your heart where you have oppressed those below you while still thinking you're praising God. I pray that God never looks at the American church and sees us as he saw the Israelites in Isaiah 58 as those crying out to God, as those doing the religious check marks, but not following Jesus. I pray that when we call, the Lord will answer. And he'll say, here am I. I could have every head bowed and every eye closed in the room today. There are some in this room, and I'm sure they're here because they're in every church that have made their Christianity into a list of check marks instead of into a relationship. This morning you may be sitting here and you say, you know what, Pastor Philip, I don't know what you're even talking about with all this fasting and, and prayer and all this stuff. I'm, I'm brand new to this whole Christianity thing. I don't know anything about it. I don't even know Jesus in my heart. My first prayer is for those who have never asked God to be the God of your life, to take away the sin, to take away the, the evil things that we have done and replace them with his righteousness. If that's you today, I ask you to slip your hand up with every head bowed and every eye closed. Slip your hand up. I can pray with you today. Thank you. The second group that I want to pray for this morning is those that you find yourself following religious duty but not understanding the relationship. If that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up. You say, well, what if someone sees me? They need to raise their hand up too if they're looking around trying to judge people. This morning, I'm going to pray for these two groups. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are a loving God. We thank you that you're a forgiving God. God, and even when we stumble, even when we mess up, even when we look at ourselves and we say, I'm so good, and then we realize, oh, I missed the boat completely. God, you're still there to forgive us and to move us forward. God, firstly, I pray for the group that raised their hands for salvation for the first time. God, I pray that you would show them that you are the God of forgiveness and the God of grace, that you can take away all the sin and the evil and the bad things that we have done and you replace it with your son Jesus and his forgiveness. God, I pray that, that they would make you the Lord of their life today, the boss of their life from this point forward. God, for the second group, I pray that you would break this, this idea of religious obligation. God, help us to understand that when we serve you, we serve you with joy, with excitement. We don't serve you out of, out of obligation. We don't, we don't fast because we have to fast. We fast because we want to hear your voice. We pray that when, when we look to you and we ask you to intervene, you will say, here am I. God, for this morning, I pray that 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 obligation would be broken from this point forward. Call us into a relationship to leave behind religious obligation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.